Huh? We've got one up there, and I hope so. Just one? Anybody else need a book? Here you go. All right, I'm down to five. These are the last five books. Anybody need a book? Okay. It's fine. You, uh, you may not agree with your husband on everything in this book. <laughs> All right, it's time for us to get started this morning. We are starting the book of Revelation today. Easiest book in the entire Bible. I know everyone always looks forward to a study of Revelation because it's just like taking a nap. So you may recall on Wednesday, Don started the series with an introduction that looked at kind of the, uh, a grand overview of the book. We're starting with lesson one this morning, which means we have 40 minutes to cover a whole eight verses. One of the things that Don mentioned I, I think is important to kind of look at in the context of these eight verses. And that was that, uh, that quote by Martin Luther, that Jesus Christ is not anywhere to be found in this book. And, and as it was pointed out, at that time, uh, Jesus Christ is mentioned in the first five words. Right? The revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we start the consideration of the book of Revelation, we have to start by looking at these verses as being a prologue to what's in the book. Now, what, what's a prologue? Let's say that again. Okay, it's the beginning. Often we look at it not just as an introduction, but, but sort of as... Um, if we were thinking about a movie, a prologue would be the very first scene that sort of sets the stage for everything else that's going to happen. Uh, I, well, when I was younger, I haven't watched any of the new stuff, but when I was younger, I really loved to watch Law and Order. I don't know if anybody else here likes Law and Order. But you have that very first scene, and in that first scene, you have something happening. There are people having an argument. Um, you see a robbery go awry, something, and then the and then it cuts to a scene where where the dead body is found, and you have the you have the two detectives coming in, and they make some wise cracks about what's going on, and then it cuts to the opening credit. But that's the prologue. It sets the stage. It sets the tone for everything that's going to happen. So as we look at these first eight verses, we have some important material that's given to us. And so we need to look at the rest of the book through these first few verses. So what do you think the most important part of what we can learn about the book of Revelation is found even within verse 1. 
What? It's from God. Revelation and, and Hebrews are very different books from most of the rest of the New Testament. What makes them different? I mean, obviously the content of Revelation is very different from the, from the rest of the New Testament. But what about this first bit, this first verse, is different than, for instance, all of Paul's epistles? Okay. To show his servants. And so this is a much more general book. What else? How does the book, how does the book of Hebrews start? We have it memorized. It's something that makes Hebrews different from all the epistles that are around it. Who is the author? Revelation, like Hebrews, doesn't identify an author as the very first part of the book. If John is the author of the book, and I have no reason to doubt that he is, when does John get mentioned? What? Verse 4. John to the seven churches in Asia. What do we have in the first three verses then? We have a statement of ultimate authorship, right? Right? The opening words of the book declare that it is not the work of man. This is not what John had to think on any subject. But it talks about the true authorship. The writer of Hebrews doesn't put his name. And remember, people in that time wrote letters very differently than we do. If you get a letter in the mail, what's the first? where is the first place you look? If you don't recognize the handwriting, where's the first place you look? You look at the bit at the bottom that says what? It says who wrote it. You go all the way to the end so that you can see, love Aunt Martha. Right? People in those days were, I, I think, rather more practical than we are because they recognized if I put it at the end, everybody could go to the end and see who wrote it. They just put it at the beginning. So Paul writes a book. What's usually the very first word of, of all of the letters that Paul writes? Paul. Why do you think he did that? So everybody would know who wrote this. Paul. The book of Revelation doesn't start that way. It doesn't start with John to the seven churches in Asia. How does it start? It starts with what it is. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. Or the Christian standard which we're using for, for teaching this year. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants. So right, right off the bat, we have the ultimate author of the book. In other words, if John is writing, is it John's job to just write what John thinks? No, he's writing revelation. So the ultimate author of this book is not John, but, but God. The revelation of Jesus Christ 
that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So if God wants to reveal this, he has, if God wants man to know this, he has to reveal this to man. How did God do that? Through John. And so that's why we have verse 4. John to the seven churches of Asia. So the ultimate author of the book is God. John is the one through whom the revelation is made. We also, as you notice, as you notice in your book, We have included in the salutation God the Father from Him which is and which was and which is to come. What does that tell us about the, about the one from whom He got this, this revelation? What? And? Okay. We have a word for that. What word is that? Eternal. The eternal one. He always was, he is now, and he always will be. He's eternal in nature. What does that immediately tell us about him? That he's different than we are. What do I know about myself? Have I always been? Nope. Am I right now? Yes. Will I always be? I can make an argument for that. But will I always be in the same sense that God is? No. So from Him which is and which was and which is to come. So this is a statement of the eternity of God. So God the Father. We also have... In verse 4, from the seven spirits before his throne. So the author of our book identifies that with the Holy Spirit. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. So within these first couple of verses, within these first few verses, what do we have? We have a statement that tells us what? of each member of the Godhead. So this is a revelation that came from God in God's entirety. What do you think the purpose of the book of Revelation is? Just... Why, does God, why did God send this message to John to disseminate to man? Hope is the big reason. So, Brother Osteen says, hope is the big reason. Does anybody agree with that? Does anybody disagree with that? Maria? <laughs> I tend to agree with that. The reason why God sends this revelation to John is to give hope to Christians. Why do they need hope? Oh, be blunt about it, Dwight. They're not exactly the best. As, what circumstances are they in? Persecution. If you'll remember from the introductory material and, and what Don went through on Wednesday, and I tend to agree with this, I tend to date this book from the middle to the end of the reign of Domitian. And that is a time period that is marked by heavy persecution. And we think of persecution sort of like we think of persecution sort of like what we read about Paul. 
where the Jews would persecute him in a city. This wasn't just that. Let me ask you a question. What do you think is a worthy punishment for a traitor? Okay, theater awards, normally execution. Normally, that's what we think of as the punishment for being a traitor. And what you'll recall from what Don said on Wednesday was, under Domitian, we have really the strong establishment of the worship of the emperor as a god. Before him, emperors became gods upon their death. Remember he had that quote from Nero? We, we don't do this because divine honors aren't given until one leaves this realm. Domitian thought that was not quick enough. And so it was important that people begin to worship him as a god while he was still living. Well, what happens if you don't worship the emperor? Then, as a god while he's still living. What does that mean? You're a traitor. That's what that means. We look at how do we look at the old law? What, what's the characteristic of the old law as, as we consider it with its relationship with the Jewish people? That it was both a spiritual and a civil law, right? It said how they were supposed to interact with each other, but it also specified how God wanted them to interact with Him. And so a violation of civil law was by necessity also what? A violation of divine or religious law. This is almost kind of the mirror image of that. When the when the emperor sets himself up as God and says, you will worship me as a God. Hmm? And you don't do that. What have you done? Well, you violated religious law because he said, I am a God and you're going to worship me as a God. But he's also the civil leader, so what else have you done? You've also committed a... a a criminal offense under the civil law. And that is a crime against the emperor as the head of state as well as the head of religion. Which made it also what? Treason. This is treason. So Christians in the first century, at the very end of the first century, were beginning to be persecuted not just as people who were threats to the Jewish religious system, but as traitors to the state. Could you imagine being considered a traitor to the United States of America for being a Christian? Is that the sort of thing that could happen? Why do you say yes, Dwight? Exactly. We've seen this happen before. Could it happen here? In the right set of circumstances, yes, it could happen here. What do you think the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire, how do you think they reacted when Domitian said, I want you to worship me as, as not, I, I don't just want you to honor me as emperor, I want you to worship me as a living God.
Exactly. It became more of a, yes, it became more of a challenge, yes. Yes. Well, and they do weird things. Oh, it's not just that. Remember, in the first, <clears throat> in the first couple of centuries, as far as the Romans were concerned, Christians practice cannibalism. Yeah, uh, don't get me wrong, the Jews didn't have it easy. And, and during, during this time, as I recall, the Jews weren't even allowed in the city of Jerusalem. They had been expelled. And it would be something like 150 before the Romans would even allow them back into the, into the boundaries of the city. So when they destroyed the city in, in AD 70, they meant business. We're going to take care of this. And it was a good long time before they were even allowed back in. But I mention this because, I mention this because what we're looking at here is, is a statement that is made. This is the revelation of God that was given in verse 1. It says, to Jesus Christ. And then in verse 4, it was transmitted to whom? It was transmitted to John. And what we've said is the purpose of the book overall is what? To give hope to the Christians. Well, why did they need hope? They needed hope because they were being persecuted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think that you're wrong. I, I would hasten to add that there has been some limited Roman persecution of, of, of even Christians before. Uh, for instance, why did, why did Paul meet with Priscilla and Aquila outside of the city of Rome? How did they meet up? Does anybody remember? Well, they were tent makers, but Priscilla and Aquila were from Rome. Why weren't they in Rome anymore? They were expelled from Rome. The, the Jews and the Christians weren't getting along, apparently, and they were, they were invited to leave. But more to the point, the emperor, which I believe was Nero at that time, Nero was having his own problems, and it was pretty convenient for him to blame all of his problems on the Jews and the Christians. And so expelling them from Rome was a, was a very convenient scapegoat. But now we've got organized oppression coming from above where the people who are being accused aren't just being accused of being general criminals, but actual traitors to the state. And people being people, we tend to assign different tiers to different crimes, right? 
If I go into Walmart and I steal a head of lettuce because I haven't eaten in a week, people tend to overlook that a little bit, right? If I go into Walmart and I shoot someone, people tend not to overlook that, right? We don't usually think of it this way, but we tend to get really upset at traitors. And, and as was mentioned earlier, in our time, and if we're in time of war, that becomes a crime worthy of death. Well, guess what? In that time, it didn't matter if you were at war or not. It was always a crime worthy of death. And so we've got a, a persecution going on. And it's really easy to look at what's going on around you and say, what about it? This is horrible. This is bad. It's never been this bad. Why am I, why am I going, not only why am I going through this, but what, what's going to happen when it's done? Is Domitian going to be able to wipe out all of Christianity? I mean, we sit, here, we sit here and we shake our heads no and say, look, we're Christians. Obviously it didn't work. But if you're a Christian in the first century, going through the persecution of Domitian and you're thinking to yourself, most, many of the Christians I know have been put to death. There's only a few of us left. How's this all going to work out? What's the answer to that? Norman? Yes, look back at Elijah. Elijah wins the contest on Mount Carmel, puts all of the priests of Baal that were there to death, more than 700 people. And by the end of the next day, where is he? Depressed and asking God to kill him because he's running for his life. So if you're a Christian in the first century and you're asking yourself that question, I mean, we sit here almost 2,000 years later, we say, look, we're here. Obviously, Domitian didn't put an end to Christianity. We have the benefit of hindsight, but when you're going through it, why do you... What's the answer for that Christian in the first century? The answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. Will there still be a church in 10 years? I don't know. Mm hmm And, and especially if, if you would consider that the church is the kingdom. And it looks like he's going to wipe it out. What does that mean about Jesus saying that you know, the gates of Hades will never prevail against what I'm doing? So they have, absolutely. And that's what I'm trying to drive toward. These people have doubt in their minds. And they legitimately have doubt in their minds. We have the benefit of hindsight and saying, the church survives this. It's bad, and it's bad for a long time. But the church survives this. The gates of Hades do, in fact, not prevail against what Jesus has done. But one of the big purposes of the book of Revelation is to tell those people, hold on, this is not the end. And I think that's why it's really important that we take to heart the words that we see several times in this book. In verse 1, in verse 1, uh, in chapter 1, in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Oftentimes, when we approach this book, how do we approach this book? And when I say we, 
I mean the broad, expansive we. Yeah, this is, this is John writing a revelation about what's going to happen at the end of the world. When I look at Acts 2 and verse 38, and I consider the answer that is given, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll be given the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Part of my consideration of what that answer is is given is that it is an answer given to a specific question. What was it that the Jews on the day of Pentecost were really concerned about? When they asked Peter and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Do you think they were asking Peter and the other apostles, how can we speak in tongues? You think that was the consideration they had when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Felt the weight of guilt because why? Not just somebody. Peter had... Yes, that's it exactly. Say that again. The hope they've been waiting for. God finally sent the Messiah that He had been promising for centuries. And what did we do? We killed Him. Now there's a problem. You remember the parable of the wicked vine dressers? We just talked about it a few Wednesdays ago. Man goes off after renting out his vineyard and he sends servants and what happens to those servants? They're beaten and killed. Eventually he sends his son and, and, and what do the servants do? They say, Let's kill him and take his inheritance. And so Jesus says at the end of that, so when he comes back, what is, what is the owner of the vineyard going to do? And what's the answer that the Jews give him? <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it's blunt enough. What's he going to do? He's going to kill them and give the vineyard to those who are more worthy. Now, I don't know if any of the Jews standing there on the day of Pentecost remembered that or not. But that's the sort of thing that they would have been thinking about as they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? We have offended God. We killed the Messiah that He sent us. In answer to promises that He had made as far back as Abraham and Adam. And we killed him. Now if you're God, and you look at life like we do, what do you do to people who take what you offer them freely and they just spurn it and they kill the messenger? Remember the parable of the wicked vine dressers? These are people now that are thinking that we stand in, we stand under judgment of death. What's going to happen to us? The same thing I think can be said about the, the Christians to whom John writes this book. They're looking at life and they're thinking, this is horrible. Don't know if things are going to last. And what the book tells us almost immediately is that these are things that will soon come to pass. Why do you think it says will soon come to pass? And I did see your hand, Norm. Why do you think it says will soon come to pass? Because he's 
He's giving them hope not just about the future, but also what? Their future. These are things meant to encourage you. Norman? <laughs> okay. So these are things that must occur shortly. This is a revelation that was relevant to the people that received it. Now again, we tend to look at this book and we tend to think, this is talking about the end of the world. But what John is doing here is he's saying, God has a message for you that is relevant to you right now. And that's important for us as we read this book. Because, and remember, Don talked about this on Wednesday as well. We tend to look at this book as something that's, you know, it, it deals with things that happen in the far distant or are going to happen in the far distant future. This is just a book about the end of the world. And it's not a book about the end of the world. This is a book intended to give hope to Christians who are being persecuted. So that they know, what do they know? That no matter what happens, God is in control. God is on His throne. And so I think that's another part of the reason why it's really important for us to acknowledge the very beginning of the book, those first, four verse, or those first three verses, don't mention John at all. Where does the message come from? This doesn't come from John. This is not John's word of encouragement to the Christians. This is what? This is the revelation of God. Maureen? Does it? Oh, well, yeah, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. But again, what does that talk about? Who did the, who the message come from and how did it get here? Ultimately, the message came from God. And it's only sent through John. But yes, I, I don't know how I missed it, but you're absolutely right. Right there, it, the last word of verse 1 is, is John. Blessed is the one who, what? So we look at verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy. And keep. All three of those are important. Faith comes by... See, everybody knows the next word. Faith comes by hearing. But if I hear, what does that necessitate? Well, it necessitates the Word of God, but it also necessitates what? Obedience to it. It's not enough that I listen. There are a number of blessed statements that are given through the book. So he that reads, hears, and keeps. In chapter 14 and verse 13, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors. How do you think that gives hope to Christians? How does that give hope to Christians? It's really, even if they kill me, they haven't ended me. It is. And it's not just devastating for me, but also because I love you. 
Imagine what it would, would be like to come in and discover most of the people that are here this morning not just aren't showing up, but can't show up because they're dead. And so the statement that blessed, you know, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord for they rest from their labors, that should be comfort not just to me in saying, if it's over for me, I rest. But it's also comforting in the fact that if you're gone, at least I can take comfort in the fact that you rest. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments in chapter 16, verse 15. Blessed are those that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In chapter 20 and verse 6, that uh, have part in the first resurrection. In chapter 22 and verse 7, that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And in verse 14, that do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates into the city. John will periodically, as we've just seen, as he moves through the book, extol God and extol His Son. And we see that to a good degree here in these first few verses. In verses 5 through 7, we have a statement made about Christ. So He is the faithful witness. What does that mean? That He's the faithful witness. It means that He's trustworthy. When He says something, it is to be believed. The first begotten of the dead, why is that important? What does it give us hope about? Right? If he rose from the dead, what does that mean for me? It means that I'll be resurrected too. Paul, in fact, did discuss that, right? If Jesus wasn't resurrected, then what? It's all foolishness. We have no hope. Of all men, we are the most to be pitied. Why? Because we believe something that's false. but the first begotten of the dead. First usually denotes what? That there'll be more after. So yeah, there'll be a second. He is the prince of the kings of the earth. What does that tell you? And we also use the phrase king of kings and lord of lords. What does that mean? Okay. Okay. We tend to look at kings and say there's no one above the king. And what John tells us is there's someone above the king. Him that loved us, which ought to be comforting and reassuring above almost anything else. He washed us from our sins. He made us kings and priests. And then, and then finally, to Him be glory and dominion. All glory and all dominion belongs to Him. Well, that apparently is our time for this morning. Uh, I believe Don will be taking over next Sunday. Um, and so, uh, thank you for your attention and your comments, and uh, we'll see you all next week. I praise you with all